first case? Or we Just in general, we've had several personal conversations, correct? We had a conversation in the jail, one-on-one. -on -one, okay. And conversation when I took you back to your residence. Okay. And then a conversation again when I told you don't call my wife. Yes. So, three. The third time, when, when was that, do you recall? Was that over the phone or in, yeah. that was in person? Mm -hmm. So, uh, it was in, over the phone. Over the phone, okay. Um, I'm just referring to, to in-person. Um, so in, in that conversation we had in the, in the jail uh, before I was released, um, when you were presenting me, or it was about the time I think you were presenting me the, uh, the condition for me to be released by uh, either, uh, or by giving up my firearm, um, I think it was about that same time frame. Um, do you recall uh, telling me, and I think that was when you gave me your business card as well. Um, do you remember me, or do you remember telling me that uh, basically I could reach out if I, if I had any issues with what was going on with this whole process, that I could reach out to you if I had any questions or concerns, correct? Not in the jail, that was incorrect. I gave you my card standing outside your residence in between your house and in the garage okay but the conversation that we had so um, so okay maybe you gave me the card when we were at the house after you took my firearm but in the jail when we had that conversation you don't recall actually know what it was before that because that was the third charge correct when we had that conversation at my house or that was no that was after the second charge that was after the second charge when... Your Honor, objection, confusing and misleading. Can you just clarify what exactly it is that he's... Well, I'm trying to step... From the... From just the take a moment, gather, gather your thoughts and ask a question. I'm just trying to establish when, when events happened. I'm um, thinking out loud, so just take a moment, gather your thoughts, ask a question. Okay. So during one of the conversations that we had in, in the jail... Uh, do you recall mentioning to me that if I had any concerns uh, or, or any issues that I could reach out to you? No, because I, I do not recall that. But not as a not on a personal basis, of course. It was just on a professional basis. If I had any issues with with what was going on in the proceedings, the the the, um, um, the actions, what was actually taking place with all the the arrests and all that kind of stuff. Um, you don't recall mentioning that if I had any, any questions or issues about that or, about or that, like the investigations. About the investigation. Yes. Right. Right. Sorry, your answer was about yes. It, it, I did say that about the investigation. Yeah, questions or concerns about the investigation would be correct. Now the 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 phone call, the or rather the voicemail that you received. Uh, Was that, I mean, was that voicemail, was the body of that voicemail, the main point of that voicemail regarding the situation with the, what should be investigated or what, what I guess should have been part of the investigation or, um, and, and the reason for the call, if you listen to the voicemail, did you not understand that the reason for the call was, it was pertaining to the, the reason for the investigation, the noise, the, the idea about why it's a nuisance and so forth? No, I'm not certain I understand your question. You don't understand that the, the voicemail that you received had anything to do with the investigation at all? It didn't. Are you referring to, to the investigation only of the phone calls that's the only investigation I'm involved in but wouldn't the reason for those phone calls being made be part should, shouldn't that be part of that investigation as I told you before no. hmm. I'm just I'm, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around that concept Because, I mean, obviously, I'm not an investigator. Uh, I, I wouldn't know the first thing about doing a professional uh, police investigation necessarily, but 
Uh, hmm. So in normal in normal investigations, uh, where you're given a, an assignment to investigate a situation, would you typically investigate a motive for the uh, alleged crime or law violation? Well, if you could give me some examples, maybe, of, of when you would uh, investigate a motive uh, as to why something happened or allegedly happened. I mean, is it only in certain, in like serious crimes, like say murder or uh, something to that effect? Is that, would that be the only time that, that an investigator would look at motive? Or would every investigation, or should rather, should every investigation uh, motive be considered? I guess motive should be considered in some investigations, correct? Yeah. But in this investigation here, you didn't you didn't investigate the motive as to why the phone calls were being made. No. Now you said, sir, the, the voicemail that we got to listen to, you said that was uh, left for you approximately what date? August the 8th, 2020, approximately 6 a.m. Okay. And uh, you said you, you were able to procure a, uh, a warrant based on that phone call, you were able to uh, establish charges, I'm not sure the terminologies, but you were able to file the charges and, and procure the warrant based on that voicemail, correct? Yes. Uh, when did you, uh, what was the date do you recall that you, or how many days later was it when you uh, made the arrest? I don't know. A couple days, two or three? It was either that day or a couple days after. In, in August, right? August of 2020? Well, I mean, it's a little confusing, I have to say, because according to your sworn statement, it states here that Detective S. Tom Porter's Ainsville Police Department being first duly cautioned and sworn to pose a that Brandon Scott Killer and on or about the 8th day of July, A.D. 2020, at the Zanesville, excuse me, at the city of Zanesville, County of Muskingum, State of Ohio, did, and of course it goes on and state what you've already stated as far as the charge. But it says here that it was on the 8th of July that, that this happened. So, but now you're saying that it was around the 8th of August? I have no idea what you're looking at. I'm looking at your sworn statement, sir, that you submitted to the court, your affidavit. And this says that, I, I'm trying to understand because as far as I, I when I look at the, uh, the, the warrant for the first initial round of charges let's see what was the date on that let's see that was July 22nd or the 22nd of July however you want to state it of 2020 when the the first couple of charges came through and then the the first couple of cases were created because of those charges the warrant was and the arrest and so forth so that was on the 22nd of July but then according to your sworn statement on the 8th of July, I guess that was why this, this next uh, or third case and the, the, the next charges were created. So was it in July or was it in, was it in August? Your call to me on the voicemail came in August the 8th. 2020 at 6 a.m. Six a.m. Okay. But according to your sworn statement, it says that the 8th of July. And this is this was on the backside of the warrant that was issued that you came to my house and arrested me for uh, in the beginning of August, which I recall. Your Honor, may, may I um, view the document um, the defendant's referencing? 
You should have a copy of it. It's it's the affidavit that uh, Mr. Porter submitted to the court. Just share. Uh, here, I'll give you a copy. One second. Let me find extra copies. Uh, here's a file. Do you want to? Uh, I'm going to give it right back to you. Okay. Just so you know, that's one of the affidavits that I submitted. It's got some extra evidence in there. Yes. Well, can we go ahead and proceed with the question, or should we wait? Just wait for the review. Okay. Ask them questions about. And if you're going to ask the witness about a document, you may want to show them the document so they can respond. Well, I could definitely do that, but it's a sworn statement. He should know what he what he uh, uh, turned into the court as far as, as far as a sworn affidavit. He should be aware of what he stated on a. I'm not going to ask him questions about it. Would you, would you like me to show you the document? That would help. Is it all right if I approach the. Yes. And do you remember that being the, the backside of that warrant that was issued that you uh, arrested me on in the beginning of, of August? Uh, it was around the, the 10th, I think, is when you made the arrest. Uh, when you were at my house, but that was the that was printed on the back side of the warrant that I had received after I was released from the jail. So, do you do recall this the statement, sir? Yes. Okay. So again, coming back to the the date and your testimony here today, you stated that it was in August when the voicemail was placed and uh, the new charges were were created and the new warrant was procured or, or created or however you want to state it um, and that's when you arrested me and this is the affidavit that you had uh, submitted to the court that was printed on the back side of the warrant that was given to me when i was released from the uh, from the jail so and on this document that you said you recognize that was on the actual warrant for my arrest at the beginning of august it states here that it was the beginning of July. So was there a, a different incident that happened on the 8th of July that prompted you to come to my residence and arrest me or to get the warrant or to have the char charges filed in the beginning of August? Well, I mean, shouldn't the, whatever happened on the 8th of July, shouldn't that have been covered in whatever charges were filed at the end of July in the original uh, charges in the original cases? You asked me about your question, sir. Okay, I apologize. That was a lot. Um, so was there something else that happened on July 8th that I'm unaware of? No, not that I'm aware of. So then, the, how is the date July 8th relevant? I have no idea. Well, you should, sir. It's in your testimony. It's in your sworn affidavit. It may have been a clerical error. Well, it's got your signature on it, sir. So, I mean, it may be a clerical error, but you signed on it. You, you, you accepted what it says. I mean, even if it's a clerical error, when you put your signature on there, you accepted that that date. So if there was nothing that happened on July 8th, to your knowledge, and definitely not to my knowledge, uh, as a matter of fact, I talked to records. There was only a few phone calls made. Uh, but nothing out of the ordinary or concerning. I, I guess I'm just a little confused because you were able to procure the, the warrant and do the arrest based on a wrong date? Or do the dates not matter? I'm, I don't know if I understand. I mean, aren't, aren't the dates of when things happen pretty important when it comes to investigations? They are. Isn't accuracy pretty important too when it comes to investigations? I mean, absolutely. I mean, after all, if you're investigating a situation, if it's not accurate, you can't guarantee that somebody's going to give it, be given the, a, a fair investigation, right? Not necessarily. How so? That would only be my opinion that 
Sure. Well, sure. No, please tell me. I'm just I'm, I'm interested in your opinion. If if there isn't any accuracy with an investigation, how could that be a fair investigation? The investigator could look through and find the correctness, or find how to correct it, or what the accurate dates were. Sometimes victims will misquote dates and stuff like that. So we find that it's different. But in something like this, I mean, this isn't just filling out a report that can be changed later. I mean, this was a sworn affidavit that you submitted to the court, and you signed your name on it. You didn't bother to double-check to make sure that the dates were correct? I don't. Apparently, that, that is my signature, so apparently I did not. Hmm. Okay. Now, you had said, sir, that uh, prior to my arrest at the beginning of August and prior to the voicemail that was played, um, you had mentioned that there was 10 previous calls to, is it your personal cell phone or to the, the your desk phone? or Desk phone. Okay. So you had received 10 previous voicemails? Yes. Okay. So none of those 10 previous calls were actual Correct. conversations? Phone calls. In any of those phone calls, were there any actual conversations where you actually picked up the phone and talked, or were they all just voicemails that were left during the calls? I submitted them with the case. I would have to look at them okay. to know whether they were just calls or... So you have evidence of these, these 10 previous calls that you're referring to? Okay. And just to clarify, is that just the phone record or like the, in the, the call log or do you actually have the recorded conversation? guess I'm going to tell you I have both. I have okay. the calls that were, if there was voicemails, I have them. Okay. And I also have the call log that was done from your phone. The call. So like just the, it just shows you the phone number, when it was made, when a call was made or whatever, that sort of thing? Yes. Okay. So no real details as far as what was, what transpired and what was said or anything like that. It's just basically a call log? On the search warrant, yes, just call log. On what search warrant? The search warrant that was executed on your phone. You're saying that's what was used to, to get the search warrant, or it was actually printed on the search warrant? I'm just trying to understand what you're, what you're saying. The forensic download of your phone revealed phone calls after July 28th. Okay. Okay. So let me ask you, sir, have you been certified or have you taken any tests to show that you're clairvoyant or able to read minds or anything of that sort or nature? Sorry, what was the question? If he's uh, been certified as a clairvoyant, uh, have any special abilities to read minds or um, anything of that nature? Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, telekinesis, that sort of thing. Just the special abilities that we, we see in, this, in the sci-fi shows all the time but and we hear about that people supposedly have have you ever taken any tests have you ever been uh told that you're clairvoyant or able to read people's minds or anything of that nature no. okay so then basically everything that you would know about someone else is a presumption it's something based on maybe your experience um you know, up until that given moment in time um Maybe whatever insight you might have is 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 that how you're able to, to formulate your opinions about a, a situation? I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, when you're investigating a, a matter, I mean it's it, it's it's really impossible to really know something correct. I mean, especially when it's still early on in the investigation, you really don't know anything. You're just gathering information and evidence. So, but you. Like, for example, well, a prime example right now, like, the, could you tell me what I'm thinking right now? Your Honor, this is so off base. Well, no, 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 let me, I'll get to the question. I'll get to the question. Ask the question. So in, in your affidavit, you stated also, not only did you have the, the wrong date, but you also stated that I knowingly 
made these telecommunications to do all these things that it states harass, intimidate, and on and on and on. But you have no way to know what I know or what I'm thinking. That's only an assumption or a presumption based on your experience, correct? It's called culpable by mistake. But you have no way of knowing what anyone else actually knows unless no, they tell I, you correct. I'm going to object. This is going to call for a legal conclusion. This is where Mr. Kilner could probably benefit from legal counsel. Sir, I'm just I'm looking at the statement here, and how can anybody know what I know as if they can read my mind? It's impossible. Okay. What you're asking the detective to make is a legal conclusion. Okay. Well, he's already made that if conclusion. Asking, if you're asking him the facts or the basis for his affidavit, you can ask him those questions, okay? <clears throat> so I guess if it's appropriate to ask it this way, how could you possibly know if I knowingly was making those telecommunications to harass an intimidate or, or any of these things that are alleged? Your Honor, I'm renewing my objection at this time. I think that's a proper question. So therefore, you should answer it, correct? Mm -hmm. My number was purposely called. And the voicemail was purposely left. <clears throat> okay, but... So does that mean every voicemail that's made or any every purposeful call is done in a, a guise to abuse or harass and intimidate people? I'm, I don't know if I understand. I wouldn't say every phone call is made that way. I, I sometimes get very pleasant phone call voicemails. So then you wouldn't consider every voicemail or every call that was made purposefully as, a, as an attempt to abuse or intimidate or harass somebody, correct? Not ever. Okay. But in this situation you did? Yes. And what makes this different? He was told not to call. So, but it doesn't state in the in the charges that um, I was being charged for calling. It states in here that I was being charged because I called and with the supposed intent to or alleged intent to harass, intimidate, or abuse. So, um, and, and honestly, that, that brings up another question. When I was told not to call in the court during the, the uh, arraignment, the, the only phone number and the only, uh, well, I guess phone number that I was told not to call was the uh, non-emergency line for the police department. I was never instructed in any way, shape, or form prior to the incident uh, when I was arrested at the beginning of August not to contact you whatsoever. That wasn't until after you had uh, created the, I guess, third charges, the third case, and the third, second warrant. If I got that correct? You have to ask a question. I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I got the facts. Um, it's, it's so convoluted, it's hard for me to keep up. Um, So you say that I was uh, I was arrested at the beginning of August because I made the phone call, correct? And left the voicemail. Yes. But the sworn affidavit says that I was arrested, or the charges were created, and the warrant was created, and so on and so forth. And we're sitting here today because, and it states right here. I mean, according to your affidavit, it says that. Um, I did allegedly, well, that actually didn't say that. It says, did knowingly make or cause to be made a telecommunication or knowingly permit telecommunications to be made from a telecommunications device under personal control to another, uh, blah, 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 uh, with the purpose to harass, intimidate, or abuse. So there's, there's, there's these conditions here, and of course, if it was just you know, if it was just left off at uh, uh, did knowingly make or cause to be made a telecommunication, then, then that would be fine. But it goes on further and qualifies 
that. It's not just about making the communication, it's about making the communication with the intent to harass and intimidate or abuse. So on one hand, I, you're telling me that the charges were created in the beginning of August, the third, third charge and the third case, the second warrant, was all created because I made the phone call and left a voice when I was told I wasn't, but then according to your sworn affidavit, it was because I did those things, but supposedly with the intent to harass, intimidate, or abuse. So I'm just trying to clarify here, because according to your sworn affidavit, it's, it seems to me to be prejudice, but... What's the question, sir? I'm just trying to, to clarify well, was I arre was I arrested because I made the phone call and left the voicemail, or was I arrested because I was uh, supposedly knowingly abusing, intimidating, and harassing people? The totality of it all. You made the phone call and was verbally So are you aware of uh, uh, the First Amendment of the Constitution, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to express oneself? Yes. Is there a possibility that in any way, shape, or form throughout the course of all these events that the way that I, or the way my personality is, the way that I express myself may be misconstrued as abuse or as something else? Well, exactly, exactly. So how can you make a judgment call on, on my personality saying that I knowingly did something if you have no idea what my personality is or who I am as a person? It would be a guess, correct? But if you don't know something and you're making a judgment call on it, that would be a guess, correct, in, in its basic definition? What would it be then? It was totality of circumstances. You. No, I'm not. I'm not. I just put that on the back burner for a second. Just the the question, just very simply. So before today, before I was able to bring these issues to your attention, were you aware of any of these failures of investigations or any of the information that was not properly uh, addressed or considered throughout the uh, investigation? Your Honor, that's a mischaracterization of his testimony, and it's not relevant at this time. I don't see how it's not relevant, sir. I mean... What I'm sustaining is nobody has agreed with your assertion that there was a some sort of failure in the investigation. And the way you phrased the question was in a way that assumes that Mr. Porter or Detective Porter had agreed with there being failures or had agreed that there has been failures. But honestly, sir, regardless if he agrees with me or not, he's testified here in this court today. Question, if you believe that there has been failures, but you haven't really done that. Well, no, I'm establishing. I mean, in these proceedings today, we're, we're establishing on the record what the those... The objection's been sustained. If you want to ask a question, you can do that. So, sir, when it comes to, uh, excuse me, filing charges, arresting people, getting warrants and that sort of thing, the, the general idea is innocent until proven guilty, correct? For, for anyone accused of a crime? I mean, that's what we hear all the time, innocent until proven guilty, right? Is that, is that how 
people are actually looked at. Yes. So then... So once I'm found innocent of this, or if I'm found innocent of this, should I expect to be assaulted at my residence? Should I expect to be arrested out of the blue for, for different reasons? Should I ex be expected to be held in a jail cell for 50 hours without any contact to the outside world um, after being found innocent? Your Honor, is it, I mean, I'm going to object. I mean, this is argumentative. Well, I'm just trying to establish, sir, it's that... Not, I, I'm not done yet. I'm, I've got more objections, actually. It's argumentative. It calls for speculation. And it's not relevant to these proceedings. What? It, you, sir, it is sustained. You are asking him about something that he believes will happen in the future based upon a contingent fact. Okay, then of let me rephrase. Finding. So it, it really calls for a lot of speculation. So if, if we're truly treated innocent until proven guilty, I mean, Is that, I mean, would that be normal treatment for an innocent person to be held in a cell without outside contact for 50 hours because of a voicemail that was left? I mean, if there's probable cause. So based on the voicemail that we heard here today, after already have been, uh, having been arrested and had multiple charges and multiple cases, And in the attempts to get some kind of, or let me rephrase that, in an attempt to make any make some sense of the situation, I leave a voicemail, and then that's that's the treatment for leaving the voicemail. Um, I, I guess I just is that normal? I mean, is that is that how? People are normally treated here when they leave a voicemail. They're held in the cell for 50 hours. Once they're arrested, it's out of my hands. So let me ask you, sir, are you aware, or, well, yeah, I mean, are, are you aware of any actual uh, violent actions or, uh, anything of that sort or that nature that I have actually committed. No, I've only investigated the telecommunications part of it. And it's basically been like what we've heard in the voicemail, correct? Just a, a yes. bit of ex expressive uh, uh, information. Um, but or, to your knowledge, has there ever been any, any actual threats where I have actually threatened any the safety of anybody specifically threatened not not assumed threat not you know are there any actual valid threats that you're aware of that you would be able to provide evidence of today to prove of me making any violent threats towards anyone And how about with my firearm? Are you aware of any any time that I've ever insinuated, brandished, um, I mean, even had it on my body during any of the altercations with police officers at my property or any time other than that, any time at all? Are you aware of any time when I've uh, brandished a firearm, threatened with a firearm, or I was only at your house once, one time before your uh, firearm was taken by me, and you did not have a firearm. Okay, but before, are you aware of any reports? Had, had, had you been privy to any information? Had anybody else made any reports of any any situations or any uh, uh, altercations that may have involved a firearm or insinuating of a firearm? Yeah, So I wonder if you can maybe explain to me why my firearm was involved in this whole process and why I was forced to give up my firearm for my freedom. Your Honor, 
this is an improper question of this witness. Is um, again calls for a conclusion of law. It wasn't the it's an order of the court, a bond consideration, and it wasn't a determination that was made by Detective Porter. Well, then he can state that. Detective Porter, if you had any input in um, the determination of bond, you can state that here today. If not, you can answer Mr. Gerard's question. I do not have any input in your condition of your bond. So you were basically just given an order to uh, retrieve the firearm if uh, if that's the way it was going to play out, basically. So you were just basically given the, the document and said, here, take this and go, go take care of it, right? You had nothing to do with it before that. And at no time you thought that was, that was odd? I mean, being that there was no evidence in the record of any threats with a firearm, no brandishing, nothing whatsoever. Uh, I mean, for the most part, other than uh, the firearm being taken from me, it was never a part of any of this. And our objection, this is argumentative and it's not relevant. This is it's sustained. It's, it's not relevant to the charge against you right now, sir. What you're arguing or what you're questioning Mr. Porter, Detective Porter about is your bond conditions, um, not the underlying charge here. So if you have well, more questions about the underlying charge, you're free to ask. Well, and I'm also asking him regarding, because he specifically was the one that came to my residence and took the firearm. I understand. These are, uh, as a condition of your bond, okay, if it is not part of the underlying elements of this charge, well, that's what I'm trying to establish, and I'm trying to understand why the firearm was, was a part of the whole proceedings because and I'm just trying to establish if, if Detective Porter had anything to do with that. That's simply all I'm trying to do. And he's answered no to that question, that he didn't have any input on your condition of your bond, and he's answered that he's not seen you with the firearm. Yeah, he just did that. Okay, and that's what I said. Yeah. So do you have any other questions? Yeah, uh, give me one second. No, sir, I think I'm good. Can you redirect? Just briefly, Your Honor. <clears throat> Detective Porter, you filed um, an affidavit with this court along with a warrant um, concerning the charges that are present before the court. Is that correct? Yes. You see, give me a copy of what I'm referencing here. I'm going to hand you what I've marked as the City of Zanesville's Exhibit B. Could you identify Exhibit B for the record? Yes, ma'am, the affidavit. And attached to the, in reference in the affidavit, it says the attached to probable cause affidavit. Is that correct? It does. Okay, so the attachment to the um, sleeve of the affidavit basically um, <coughs> sets forth all of the rationale for issuing the warrant. Is that correct? Yes. Now, who, who prepares that first page as depicted in Exhibit B? The courts. Okay, so that's actually a court instrument, correct? Yes. Okay. So any errors um, on that original page obviously weren't prepared directly by you. That is correct. Although that is your signature. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And the date does state on or about the 8th day of July. Is that correct? It does. But if you flip to page two, is this the affidavit that was attached to that warrant? Yes, ma'am, it is. 
and set forth there on page two of exhibit B does it state the accurate dates and times and relevant um, time frame for this incident? Yes, ma'am, it does. Okay. And all of the um, facts that set forth there on page two are true and accurate to the best of your recollection? Yes, ma'am, it is. And this is an actual affidavit that was prepared by you? Yes, sir. I have to object, sir. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Well, I don't know if it's an objection necessarily. You have questions? Well, I'm not sure quite how to address this. We have two signed sworn affidavits with contradicting information on them. You can ask Detective Porter about that if you want. Well, I mean, I have, and we, did, and it was just addressed. Well, I mean, it was just. Uh, uh, talked about or, or identified, but I don't know, I, I, I guess the thing I'm failing to understand here is, is it, it, you, you, you signed both documents, sir. So, I mean, regardless if it was made by somebody else, it's, it's your signature there, right? It is my signature. On two different documents, two different sworn affidavits to the court that have conflicting information. Or at least don't corroborate the, the truth of the matter. So, I mean, this is just another example of what I've been talking about. Your Honor, um, I would ask that anything be phrased in the form of a question, Mr. Lee. Sir, do you have any more questions of Detective Porter? Detective Porter, do you remember in August of last year in the situation uh, when I was hospitalized? Yeah, you mentioned earlier in the in your testimony that you uh, recalled speaking to one of the doctors uh, at the hospital, correct? I spoke to a doctor. Right. Um, <coughs> why Why did you speak to the doctor? Your Honor, Were you part of that investigation? Outside of my um, scope of redirect. Sir, um, any questions you have at this time with regard to your cross-examination of Detective Porter have to be limited to the questions that were asked on redirect regarding this affidavit or its attachment. Okay. You gotcha. have your opportunity for a gotcha. cross-examination prior. So, um, do you have any more questions with regard to the affidavit or its attachment? Well, I just have to come back to, I mean, I mean, shouldn't accuracy be important? Your Honor, I'm going to object this has been asked and answer. I believe Detective Porter has testified that accuracy is important and the 8th day of July was a clerical error and he's also testified that that error was made by the court and he did sign the document. So right. We also want to establish yeah. the FBI. Detective Porter, do you realize when you signed the document that you accepted whatever writing was written on that page? Regardless of what mistakes are there. Your Honor, um, again, objection, argumentative, and it's also been answered by the witness. No, I don't believe I asked that question if he Understood. is aware. It's overruled. I mean, if you, if you have an answer to that, you can answer. Would you like me to re ask a question? You would. Are, are you aware that when you sign a document that you are consenting, you're accepting whatever it states on that document, what's, even if it's completely false and wrong? You do understand that, correct? Yes. So regardless if it was a clerical, clerical error, you understand that by signing that document that you accepted the clerical error because it was uncorrected. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, we, we have two conflicting affidavits. I mean, I, am I the only person that sees a problem with that? No, 
know, so there's not going to be a ruling on this issue right now. We're asking questions. So if you have any other questions about this affidavit or the conflict in the affidavits, you can ask the tech reporter about them right now. Okay. If you're asking for a conclusion right now from the court, you're not going to get that. No, not a conclusion per se, just a, just an understanding. Uh. Uh, Detective Porter, in your sworn statement, uh, let me find it here. Give me one second. So, is this about the affidavit or the attachment? Yes. Okay. I just had it. Here's another copy. I got it right here. Uh, no, I apologize. It was on the other affidavit. So just to clarify, sir, the is, is the hearing today, is this covering all of the cases that have been created off of these charges, or is this only pertaining to a, to one of the cases? Or It's only this the third charge right now regarding the alleged voicemail to Detective Porter. Okay, so then with that being said, am I to expect a different trial for the other charges? Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so I guess with that being said, in regards to this affidavit, no, I don't have any other questions. Exhibit A being the voicemail recording, Exhibit B being the uh, previously filed affidavit attachment. Correct, Your Honor. Any objections to these exhibits? Well, actually, yes. Um, the uh, the attached sheet for probable cause. Um, shouldn't this all have been attached to the original warrant with the sworn affidavit as well? Because I had never seen this uh, information about the probable cause before today. 